Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel record of Matthew. The Gospel record of Matthew in Matthew chapter number 13. The Gospel record of Matthew and Matthew in chapter number 13. We are continuing with our series of the Millennial Kingdom, the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. We took some time at the beginning of the series to define our terms, to uh, explain what the Bible has to say, to be able to set the framework of prophecy so we can get a correct interpretation and making sure that what we are teaching is correct. Then we started with a time frame leading up to the Millennial Kingdom that we started with the rapture, which is the next event on God's calendar. After to the rapture is going to be a seven year period called the tribulation where God is bringing his people he, uh, the Hebrew people the Israelites back to himself then at the end of the tribulation the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth and at this time when Jesus Christ Christ comes back onto this earth, all of the rest of the armies of heaven are, are on earth are going to try to fight against Christ and his armies to try to oppose him, to try to wipe out God's Hebrew people. And when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to immediately be two events or one event that is given in two different parables, the parable of the wheat and the tares and the parable of the sheep and the goats. And this is speaking about a judgment that is going to happen right after the tribulation going into the millennial kingdom and this is a significant event that Jesus speaks about. So if you don't mind take your copy of the word of God and turn with me to the gospel record of Matthew chapter number 13. The gospel record of Matthew chapter number 13. Now remember these are called the kingdom parables speaking about what Jesus Christ is going to do on this earth. These are all going to be a fulfillment of prophecies. Uh, This is why this uh, nomenclature of the kingdom of heaven is being used, is that it is showing that it is the fulfillment of prophecy given in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ is going to establish an earthly kingdom here on this earth. Notice with me, if you don't mind, as we see this parable uh, given by the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel record of Matthew chapter 13. The gospel Gospel record of Matthew chapter 13, and notice with me in verse number 24. Matthew 13 in verse 24, the Bible says this, another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which is sown good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy fields? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, while lest while thou gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now Jesus is going to give another parable, but the disciples are going to be curious and they're going to ask Jesus about more information. Notice with me in verse number three. 36 as Jesus now gives the interpretation of this parable. Verse uh, Matthew 13 verse 36. 
Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, he that soweth good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all that offend, and them that which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, notice as this parable titles itself in the gospel record of Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew 13 and verse number 36. Notice what the uh, disciples call this parable the parable of the tares the parable of the tares it would not do injustice if we call it the parable of the wheat and the tares for clarification whichever one works but we're going to explain this parable the parable of the tares or the parable of the wheat and the tares with this, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray dear heavenly father thank you again for you being a wonderful God and as we come up to you, we're just asking that you would give us wisdom and discernment, that you would help us to have an understanding of this passage and be able to see the spiritual significant events of this and our responsibility in the here and now. Lord, give us much wisdom and discernment. And if there is someone that truly does not know you as Savior, I'm asking that you would shake them loose, that you would just help them to be able to accept it and to turn around and accept the free gift of salvation, that this is not something to play games with, but help us to understand how important this is to know that we know that we know. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As the Lord Jesus Christ is giving these kingdom parables, he comes to a very interesting parable. He explains this story, starting at verse 24, that he says, here's a man who goes out and he's sowing good seed. As he sows good seed, he's expecting to have a good harvest of wheat. But while everyone slept, the enemy came in and he began to throw in tares. Tares is a different type of plant, just like wheat. The problem is, is that the tares are going to look just like wheat. When wheat and the tares are coming up, their plants are going to be indistinguishable. It's going to look the same. The difference is going to come up when the wheat begins to come up and begins to grab its seed and begins to look more like the golden grains of wheat we're used to. That's when you're going to be able to tell, hey, these are a different type of plant. These are not wheat. And so notice this enemy came in and the Bible's very clear. It's saying this is the enemy that came in. And while men slipped, slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the meat, wheat and went away. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came to him and said, Sir, did thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence does it have tares? So they come out and say, uh, Boss, I thought you put good wheat, uh, good crops in. Why are we having this mixture crop in? Did, w did something go wrong? And the, the man of the field was able to say an enemy did this. So someone who didn't like the, the crop owner decided to try to sabotage his crop. He's trying to make it so his crop doesn't spring up the way that it should. And so the servants say, well, should we start pulling out all the tares? Should we pull them out and pull them away? Now, here's another problem with these tares is that underneath the earth, the root system of the tares will actually bind itself and wrap it around the wheat. So if you try to pull out the bad plants, you try to pull out the tares, the weeds, what will happen is that because they're wrapped around the good plants, they will also hurt the wheat as well. 
So it's made it so it's almost an impossible task to go and weed this garden out. To try to separate the weeds and not damage the good crop. Does that make sense? We're getting the scenario here. So the master says, let them both grow together. And at harvest field time, we'll take care of it then. Okay. So the disciples listen to Jesus. And finally, when they get some alone time, they bring him in and say, all right. We've been waiting all day to ask you this. What does it mean? <laughs> what, tell, us, tell us a little bit more. Now, at this time, let me remind you that parables are not meant to hide truth. But instead, parables are given to reveal truth, but only to those that want to know. That they have to have a desire to find out more about it. They have, have to have a heart to hear. So the disciples come in and say, we want to know more about this. Explain what you are meaning. So Jesus takes time to explain. Notice as he starts <coughs> giving the explanation. Verse 37. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. So that's Jesus. Jesus is going out, spreading the seed. He's trying to see as many people come to know Christ as his savior. He's trying to see as many people become born again, become Christians, become a child of the king. That's God's desire. Verse 38, and the field is the world. All right. So Jesus has gone out spreading the seed into all the world, hoping to get a good crop. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Those people have come to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy have sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world. So what happened is that the devil, who is the enemy, has come in and he has tried to go into this crop and he's tried to put in fake Christians, people who do not know Jesus as their savior, religious people in the midst of all of the good people, all the people who have known Jesus Christ as their savior. So it looks like we got two different crops all mixed together. And once again, the harvest is going to be the end of the world, the reapers of the angels. So at the very end, the tribulation, when Jesus Christ comes back, they're going to have a lot of people on earth, some who have accepted Christ, some who have not accepted Christ. And what's going to happen is that Jesus is going to have the angels separate them out, separate the wheat from the tares. The wheat is going to continue on in the millennial kingdom in their physical bodies. The tares are going to be wrapped up and they are going to put, be put into hell, wait for judgment in the lake of fire. They're going to be a separation at this time. And again, when Jesus Christ comes back, this is the event that's going to happen. He's going to separate those who are saved from those who are not saved. Now, this is a very significant event. And yet we can learn quite a bit about this at the very same time. The first thing I want to show you as we try to make a practical application is the war between the seeds. The war between the seeds. We know that there is a war between Satan and Jesus. We spoke a little bit about that this morning. This parable once again mentions it, that the <laughs> that the good man, the man of the field, the man that soweth the field is the son of man. That's Jesus. And this man has an enemy by the name of Satan. And remember that Satan is very subtle and he knows that he can't win a headlong attack against God. Every time he's tried, he does not win. And so he wants to try to hurt Jesus by hurting his children, by hurting his seed. And so there's going to be a war between these two seeds. Well, that now brings us to how do we identify it? We could see that there's a war between these two seeds. Hold your finger here. We will be coming back. But notice if you don't mind as we're making an application. Notice with me in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. If you're familiar with the great chapters of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3 should be one of them that you immediately know what it is when we turn there. Genesis chapter 3 is speaking about the, 
the fall of man, the sin at the time of the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve are now being kicked out of the Garden of Eden for disobeying God. Now, God had set one rule in the garden. You can have out, out of all the trees here, you can eat every single one of them except for one. That's mine. You can't have it. You can have all the rest of them, but not this one. It's mine. Well, Adam and Eve broke that. And it came time to the blame game. That Adam looked at his wife and said, it's her. It's her fault. She, you gave her me. She's the one who made me eat. Eve comes. Well, it's the serpent who deceived me. The serpent now goes and says, I don't have anyone else to blame. And as God is now talking directly to Satan, notice with me this promise that is said to Satan that is also a promise to us. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, there's a fancy verse that goes, that, a fancy name that goes to this verse called the Proto-Evangelium. You say, what does that mean? It just means the first promise of a redeemer, the first promise of salvation. And it was stated to Satan concerning us. Notice with me in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Genesis 3 for 15. And I will put enmity, I will make enemies between thee, that's Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. So notice there's a war going on, not just between God and Satan, and not necessarily just between Satan and the woman, but between Satan's seed and the woman's seed. There's going to be a war between them. Here's the promise of salvation. And it, this seed from the woman, shall bruise thy head and thy shall bruise his heel. And of course we know that the ultimate seed that comes from woman is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 4.4. 4, that Jesus Christ comes from, a, from the woman carrying the promises of God. He's going to die on the cross for you and for me. He's going to be buried on a borrowed tomb. He's going to rise again the third day to prove that God was satisfied with the payment that Jesus made and to prove that Jesus was indeed God. And so there's going to be a war between Satan's seed and the seed of the woman. Notice as we go on to the gospel record of John chapter 8, and we learn a little bit more about this war. John chapter number 8. So all the way back at the beginning of creation, we have this promise that there's going to be a war between the followers of God and the followers of Satan. A very significant statement is made in the gospel record of John chapter 8 that Jesus makes. He's talking to the Pharisees and he is saying something very interesting to the Pharisees. <clears throat> Notice with me in verse number 44 as he is speaking to the Pharisees. John chapter 8 and verse 44. Ye are of your father, the devil. Now that's pretty bold speaking. You think your pastor's rough from time to time. Jesus has looked at him and said, listen, your father's the devil. Now, I don't want you to try to make this application that you're going to go up to strangers in the street and go tell them that their father's the devil. That's probably not the best way to handle this. But Jesus is making a point here that ye are your fa of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He, that Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So we understand that there is a seed of Satan and a seed of God just like God had promised. Now we got to further identify this. How do we sign up to be of our father the devil? Is there a sign up sheet? I mean, does somebody make a choice? Does somebody just sing a song? I've decided to follow Satan. How does this come across? Well, I'm glad you asked. Every person who is born is born with a sin nature. Every single one of us are sinners. Every single one of us are automatically against God. We want our own ways. 
Do you know that you never have to take a child and teach him a class of how to lie? Well, if you never sit them down and teach them how to lie, where do they learn it from? Do you know that you never have to sit your kid down and say, listen, in order for you to survive life, I need to teach you how to steal cookies from the cookie jar. Well, if you've never had a class of teaching them how to steal cookies from the cookie jar, where do they learn it from? Their sin nature. They are sinners from the very beginning. Someone will say, but not my child. Yes, your child. Here's the scenario. You bring a child home. The baby's been living with you for a couple weeks. And in the middle of the night, you heard the most blood curdling scream. Ah! So you rush in there. You're trying to see if the baby's still alive. Uh, you know, thinking, all right, the baby's hungry. The baby's making a mess. Maybe the diaper pins push. What's going on? And then as soon as you turn on the light, the baby looks at you and goes, goo. He was a liar. Selfish. Nothing wrong with him. He's a liar. They're a liar from the beginning. And because of this sin nature that we're developed, our sin separates us from God. Every person is automatically in the family of Satan. What we have to do is that we have to be born again spiritually to go into the family of God. That's why Jesus said, verily, verily, you must be born again. That's John chapter 3. Verily, verily, you must be born again. Well, he's talking to Nicodemus who scratched his old silver head and said, I don't get it. It's not like I could crawl back into mom. What does this mean? And Jesus explains that every person has to have two births. You have to have a physical birth and you have to have a spiritual birth. And just as real as your physical birth was, your spiritual birth is just as real. For example, I have a daughter who just turned 16. I survived. And if she had come up to me and said, Dad, was I born? i say, of course you were. And I'd laugh at her. But Dad, how do you know I was born? I was there. I could tell you the time and place. I could tell you the hospital. I could tell you the events that happened. There was an event that led up to her being born. Well, just as real as her physical birth was, your spiritual birth is just as real. It is an event. It doesn't happen slowly. It didn't just, well, I slowly became a Christian. There was a point action event where you realized that you were a sinner because of your sin, you had offended a holy, righteous God, and you deserved an awful place called hell. But you also realize that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you personally accepted him to be your savior. The moment that you accept Jesus as your savior to forgive you of your sin debt that you owed God, the, that moment the Holy Spirit who is God comes to live inside of you. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you now are made into a new creature. You are a new creature. By the way, when we say that you have become born again, we don't believe that you can get now do whatever you want now that you're saved and you have fire insurance. You see, with this brand new being born again, you get a brand new father. And the Bible explains that every good father disciplines his child. Meaning that God will not allow us to continue in sin. Because I'm his child, he will, as we say in the South, take you outside the woodshed. He will correct our behavior. That is part of being born again. Now, may I also put an asterisk here? If you are never convicted of your sins, may I say that is Bible evidence that you are not born again? If you can tell a lie and you're not convicted over it, there is something spiritually wrong. If you have no desire to read your Bible, there is something spiritually wrong according to the Bible. Not your preacher. This is what the Bible says. Because you cannot continue in sin, your father will not allow it. We have a brand new family that we're now a part of and our father loves us so much he will correct 
our behavior. Sometimes he'll correct our behavior with conviction. If that doesn't work, he'll use a preacher to use words to point out that what we did wrong. If that doesn't work, then he'll start to do whatever is necessary to get us to finally realize maybe I should not do that. That's a father's love, by the way. That proves that I have a father who loves me who will not allow me to continue in my foolishness. Well, (laughs) those who have accepted Christ as their Savior are part of the family of God. Those who have never accepted Christ as their Savior, they're already the neighbor's kids. They are the family of Satan. And Jesus said there's going to be a war between these two Between those who are saved and those who are not saved. They are enemies together. There are problems. There's a war between the seed. Now the problem is, as we get into the wheat and the tares, is that Satan knows how to (laughs) mix in those who are not saved with those who are saved. Do you know in any good church, there are people who attend every week who are saved, but may I say that there's also in a good church people who attend every week who are not saved that think they are. They may even be deceived themselves, but they don't match up with what the Bible says. It doesn't mark up. Now, I am not getting anyone to doubt their salvation, but I will admit I'm trying to take you by the legs and shake you loose to make sure that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Because if you know that you're saved, all I'm doing is helping it nailed down. If, you, if you're saved, we're nailing it down a mile deep so you never doubt it. But dear friend, if you don't know for sure, let me tell you, you're on dangerous ground. You need to make sure that this is settled. You need to make sure that you know from the Bible that you have this salvation. Now, some people take it upon themselves. Well, if we have people inside of the church that don't match up with the Bible said, then why don't we just kick them out? Why don't we do something about that? Well, that's not my job. That's what the parable is saying. That that's Jesus' job to take care of that. Why? Because if there's someone who's not saved that we're trying to pull out, what's going to happen is that they're going to hurt the other plants in there as well. So we're going to let God take care of that business. My job is to preach the gospel and let God worry about separating the sheep and the goats, separating the wheat from the tares. Does that sort of make sense? Our job is to preach the gospel, which brings us to the second thing. Not only is there a war between the seeds, but here is a very powerful statement. The world will not be converted. The world will not be converted. Now, what do I mean by that? That means not everyone will get saved. That's just a fact. It's a hard fact and it's against God's desire because God is not willing that any shall perish, but all should come to repentance. He doesn't want to see a single person go to that awful place called hell. But the reality is, is not everyone will be converted. Now, Satan likes to get people to believe that they could win the world to Christ and change the world for Christ to bring in the kingdom. Then what will happen is that when that doesn't turn into reality, they get discouraged and they quit because it seems like their efforts fail. Let me give an example. So we believe in door knocking. We believe in going to someone's door, knocking on it, introducing ourselves, seeing if we could be a blessing with the op- desire that we want to tell them more about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <laughs> believe it or not, not everyone gets saved who we knock on their door. Now, if somebody feels like that, <laughs> that everyone's going to get saved after going out door knocking for a while, they're going to say, well, it's not working. So if it's not working, why keep doing it? Because our job is not to save people. That's God's job. I can't save anybody. My job is to evangelize the world. That means to make sure that all the world hears a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That everyone has the opportunity to hear and make a choice to receive Christ or not receive the Christ. That is my job. God does the saving. My job is to give everything I can do to give everyone a clear gospel witness. 
Now that helps me because if my, that takes the pressure off of me. I don't have to take it personally when people ex- deny Christ because they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting God. All I'm going to be judged for is not how many people got saved. I'm going to be judged for how many times did I take advantage of the opportunities given to me to witness to someone, to pass out a track, to invite them to church, to get them to listen to uh, a gospel message, to do something to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, that makes our job a lot easier, doesn't it? It takes the pressure off. I'm just supposed to be obedient and God takes care of the results. Now I'm going out, just spreading out the seed and expecting God to bring up the crop. Does that make sense? But this is important because not everyone will get saved. But our responsibility is to give a clear gospel witness to every person we possibly can. Which now brings us to a third major point in application. That we understand there's a war between the seeds. There's enmity between the people who have been born again and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and those who are the child of the devil who have never accepted Christ as their Savior. For whatever reason, they've not accepted, they've not responded to the gospel. Those are going to be a natural war. And those people can actually be mixed into a good church. We know that the world will not be converted. Not everyone will get saved. I mean, even Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them was a devil. And he was the best pastor who ever lived. Our job is not to save people. Our job is to give them the opportunity to get saved. The opportunity to respond to Christ. To pass out the seed. To give them the gospel record. To tell everyone that Jesus saves. That Jesus saves. And they make their own choice based off the information given to them. But the third thing here is that the work of Satan is deception. The work of Satan is deception. Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. And his job is to try to keep people from being saved. And he does that by deception. Now, once again, Satan as a deceiver will not let people know, hey, I want you to believe in Satan, follow after Satan. Because nobody would believe that message. But what Satan wants to do is try to give people a different Jesus. He wants to deceive them about the gospel message and what the gospel is. Notice if you don't mind some things that the Bible has to say about this work that Satan is doing. That the greatest work of Satan is deception. Notice with me the gospel record of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 Jesus is speaking of the Sermon of the Mound. And as he has this crowd of people, as he's finishing up his message, Jesus says something very powerful in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And notice with me in verse 15. By the way, this is exactly why we encourage everyone to have a copy of the Bible in their hand for themselves. Why? So you can't be deceived. This is why so many churches don't want people to have their Bible in church. If you're not looking at it for yourself, how do you know I'm telling you the truth? I don't want you to take my word off of it. You see what the Bible has to say. So notice with me Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and notice with me verse 15. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Here Jesus gives a very clear warning of false prophets. You know how false prophets are going to come in? They're going to come in with sheep's clothing. Remember that God's favorite illustration to use concerning his relationship between God and man is the shepherd and the sheep. And he says, my people are sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They listen to me. But Jesus says, beware, because these false preachers, they're going to come in looking like sheep. You guys remember the old Looney Tunes cartoon, right? Where the coyote would put on a sheepskin and try to uh, sneak in. And you have Sam, the sheepdog, who would have to lift up his hair and just kind of look. And he's always looking for that coyote. That's exactly what Satan does, is he puts in the midst of people false prophets. And they look like sheep. What do I mean by this? 
Well, they sound nice. They have a good encouraging message. They want people to feel good about themselves. And at the same time, they're going to twist the gospel message. For example, you may take someone like a Joel Olstein, who is very popular, by the way, and very nice. All reports of him personally, he's a very nice guy. However, he teaches a different gospel than what the Bible says. He says there are many ways to get to heaven. You could be a Muslim and make it to heaven. You don't have to believe in Jesus. Well, that's opposite of what the Bible says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father except by me. You see, either Jesus told the truth there and there's no other way, or Jesus is a liar and he cannot be our Savior in the first place. That's a big problem. And you have nice people. And that's the hard part, is that the false prophets are nice people. If they were mean people, drunkards, I mean, it'd be easy to preach against them. But because they're nice, that's where I get all the hate mail in. Why do you have to be so mean against so-and-so? Don't you know what a nice guy they are? God says we have to be aware of them because they're trying to change the gospel message. They're trying to water down the message. That's why just it doesn't matter how nice they are. Do they line up with what the Bible says? The way for us not to be deceived is to have an open Bible in our hand and to look for ourselves. Notice, if you don't mind, more warnings from Jesus. Matthew 24. Satan is a great deceiver. Matthew 24, notice with me in verses 4 and 5. Matthew 24, 4 and 5. Now this is dealing with end time things with tribulation, but the application still applies. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name and say, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. By the way, the gospel record of uh, the book of 1 John explains that we are currently now in present tense live in the spirit of antichrist. The word anti doesn't mean against. So some people believe that the word antichrist means against Christ. That word anti also carries the idea of replacing Christ. Do you know what the deceivers do? Is they give us a Jesus, but it is not the Jesus of the Bible. Let me tell you, the Jesus of Hollywood is not the Jesus of the Bible. All right, I'm going to get some hate mail. Let's go for it. Today, there is a brand new, great, everyone's raving show, Bible show supposedly called The Chosen. Do you know that the Mormons are the one who put out that show? And do the Mormons have the same Jesus that we do? No. So is it going to be the same Jesus? Absolutely not. But people are like, but this is accurate. Accurate to what? You know, we have to line up with what the Bible has to say. Keep looking at me. What does the Bible have to say concerning this? We need to know the Jesus of the Bible because Jesus of the gospel songs is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the contemporary Christian music is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Mormons is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Catholic Church is not the Jesus of the Bible. And this is what the false ministers are doing is they're giving people a different Jesus. You see, people don't like the Jesus of the Bible because this Jesus of the Bible one day will be my judge. They want the Jesus of the Bible that smiles at my sin and say, it's all right, you can't help yourself. They want the Jesus of the Bible where we feel sorry for him as the suffering savior. They want us the Jesus of the Bible showed in the Catholic art that shows milk toast weak hippie Jesus. But that is not the Jesus of the Bible. And this is what the false preachers are doing is they're trying to give us a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. Notice if you don't mind, the Bible says some more. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. What we're doing is we're seeing the work of Satan is deception. And he is trying to fool people and deceive people 
from what Jesus is because there's a war. We understand that the Satan is trying to put in false prophets, people who are against Jesus and mixing them in with the good seed. And that if we try to pull out the bad seed, it's going to hurt a lot of good people. Now, I could say these things inside of the church that God has set me steward over, but if I went on social media and started blasting Joel Olstein, do you think some good people who didn't know better would get hurt by it? Yes. Absolutely. This is the whole problem here, is that we try to point out error. There are going to be good people who have never been taught who are going to be hurt by this. And then the world looks at it and says, well, all these Christians can't get along. They're fighting with each other. Why should we believe in Christianity? Is that a big problem? Absolutely. This is the work of Satan. Satan has tried to set this up so we're in a lose-lose situation no matter what. Jesus gives us warning. Notice with me 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed, in, transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works." Let me tell you, I have met a lot of preachers from a different denominations. I've met a lot of preachers even from Baptist faith that are deceivers. There is a lot of them out there. And again, they are nice. They're good people. They try hard. They may even believe what they're doing is right. But they're deceivers and deceiving people away. And Jesus, all throughout the Bible, that's what we're showing you now, is that this has been the warning over and over and over. Jesus warned. Now Paul's trying to warn. Stow, stay away. Be careful. Be careful. There are people that will lie to you about who Jesus is. They're trying to change the gospel message. They're trying to change the different Jesus from the Jesus of the Bible. They want people to believe a different thing. Satan is trying to deceive people so that way they're ineffective. So they're choked out. So they can no longer tell others about Christ. Satan is trying to drown it out so the gospel does not spread out even more. Notice with me 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter two. All throughout chapter two, second Peter chapter two, uh, God is warning against false witnesses all throughout this chapter. We're just going to read one verse, but the rest of this chapter is just putting a great emphasis on these false preachers. Second Peter chapter two, verse one. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Notice this, among you. Did you know that every once in a while there's false teachers that try to show up in a church like this? And they sound good, they sound educated, but we have to be careful because they could hurt a lot of people with their deception. But there are false prophets even among the people, even as there are false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying that the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Here these people are changing the gospel message. They're trying to tell you that Jesus is not enough to pay for your sins. You know what? Jesus needs some help. So not only do you need to get saved, but you also need to get baptized. Not only do you need to get saved, you also have to do these good things. Not only do you need to get saved, you have to do this and you have to do this. Well, not only Jesus wasn't enough for, for, to die for your sins. You have to help him out with this and that. And they try to say that Jesus' blood was not enough. Well, the Bible says Jesus' blood was enough. That's all that was needed was the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There are people that said, well, it's enough that Jesus died, but he didn't have to rise from the grave. You know, he's still dead. Well, that's a big deal. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that the pr that price that Jesus paid on the cross, that God was satisfied with it. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no hope. But yet they try to change the Jesus. They try to switch this over. There are people that said, well, Jesus... <laughs> 
uh, was God, but he didn't come in the flesh. He just was a spirit. Well, that's a problem that changes the humanity of Jesus Christ. There are some people that say, well, Jesus was human and then he had God-like qualities. Well, that takes away the deity of Jesus Christ. They are trying to change the teaching of who Jesus is to replace him with a false Jesus. And there are people who believe it. All you have to do, please don't do it, but turn on TBN or whatever religious stations are. Just wait for a moment and they will say something against the Jesus of the Bible and give you a different Jesus. And it's going to hurt so many people. I remember dealing with a lady who was from the Mormon faith. Worked with her for quite a while and lunch breaks, be witnessing to her. And finally, one day she broke and we were able to give a clear presentation of the gospel again. And I said, do you believe what I told you was true? She goes, yes. Do you believe what I told you was simple? Yes. Do you believe what I told you was biblical? She goes, yes. I said, would you be willing to accept Christ as your savior? She says, I can't. Well, why not? She goes, you see, because I'm Mormon, I had a teenage boy who died in a car accident. And because we're Mormon, we believe in baptism for the dead, that we believed in order to get them out of hell, we have to have a bunch of people get baptized to get them more credit, to get them more um, favor. And if they get enough, then they'll be able to get out of hell and rise up. And she goes, we had big baptism services. We had tons of people baptized to get my son out of hell. And he goes, she said, if I believe what you said is true, and I, I kind of do, I'd also have to admit that my son's in hell right now and I can't do that. You understand what false religion did to this lady? Is it not only took away the hope of seeing her son, but it also made it where she wouldn't accept the truth when it was given to her because she wanted the falsehood to be true. That's what these false teachers do is they bring destruction and they hurt people and they're trying to take away the God of the Bible and they're trying to take away the salvation that was freely offered by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Turn me to another passage, the book of Jude, chapter number one. There's only one chapter in Jude. Right before the book of Revelation. Notice with me in Jude, and notice with me in verse number three. The book of Jude, in verse number three, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, this common salvation means it's common to everyone. Everyone has access to it. I wanted to write to you about the, the salvation that we all can have. Beloved, when I gave diligence to write to you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now, pause. Some people believe that what this says is that Jude said, well, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation, but God changed my mind and now I got to talk to you about earnestly defending for the faith. That's not what it says. It says, because I want to write to you of the common salvation, I also have to tell you that we have to earnestly contend for the faith. The word contend is a good word. It carries with it into the boxing realm that you're in a fight. You're, you're going to fight for it. Why? Because salvation is always under attack. And then anytime we stop fighting for salvation, some people say, why is pastor yelling? Why is he so upset? Why is he passionate? Because people are messing with the gospel. They are trying to change this idea that salvation is a free gift and trying to put a price tag on it. They're trying to make it so this Salvation is not common to all men. They are lying to people and people are dying and going to hell because of this lie. Amen. And that we have to fight for it. We have to preach messages. We have to call out people and say, they are not teaching the Bible because we're trying to warn people from deception. Notice as it goes on in verse four, for there are certain men crept in unawares. Notice they're going in in the midst of people unawares. What has happened is that people are minding their own business. And these creepers have come in, sneaking behind them and exploding everything and causing destruction and causing it so people are destroyed in their faith. 
There are creepers that come in and they're dangerous. And they're trying to sneak up on people with a false gospel. For there come in men crept in unawares who before old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What are we speaking about? This is a theme that has been repeated this wheat and the tares that inside there are God's people who have truly accepted Christ as their savior. And in the midst of them, there are people who are deceivers, who are creepers, who have false prophets, who are men in sheep's clothing, trying to deceive good people that the Jesus of the Bible is not the right Jesus. That the gospel message is not the gospel message. It is amazing to hear what people say. I'm not talking about other churches now. I'm talking about people inside of a Baptist church. I had people trying to say, well, there's a different gospel. That Paul had a gospel and Jesus had a gospel and John had a gospel. And that they all had a different gospel message. No, they have one gospel. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Trusting in him and him alone. That's it. God's God's promises, trusting by faith. But they try to take that away. There are people, even in Baptistic churches, that I've heard that people say, well, God has ordained some people to heaven and some people to to hell. And that you don't have a choice in the matter that if God wants you to go to heaven, you're going to heaven whether you want to or not. And by default, if you're going to hell, that's just because he didn't want you in heaven. That's a destructive thought. There are people that are hurt by this and they're destroyed by this. They're trying to change the gospel message. And Jesus is warning about this. Now, all I could do is point out and tell you what the truth is. If you have people who are in the FBI that are made to study false counterfeit bills, they don't spend time studying the counterfeits. They spend all of their time studying the truth. And if they know everything about the truth, then they'll be able to spot the deceptions easily. I'm not telling you to go take a course on world religions and learn about all the idiosyncrasies of all the different various Christianity. I'm saying, be in the truth. Be in the truth. And you won't be deceived. Does it line up with the Bible? I don't care what the radio says if that said that aliens came and planted the thing. What does the Bible have to say? What does the Bible have to say about this? There is so much deception out there that we have the source of truth. Which brings us to the heart of the matter. There is going to be people who are deceived and they think they're saved. They said, well, I said a prayer one day. Uh, Saying a prayer doesn't save anybody. Jesus Christ saves us. A prayer doesn't save you. Do you know from the Bible? What do I mean by that? Can you open the Bible and show me from the Bible that you know that you're going to heaven? We gave the illustration of my daughter earlier. If she came to me and said, dad, how do you know that I'm alive right now? I could pinch her and she could go, ow, why'd you do that for? Well, you're alive. Right, there's evidence. She could fog a mirror. Do you know that if you've been born again, there should be evidence that you're born again? The Bible speaks about these evidences in 1 John. By the way, one of those evidence we made mention before is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you are not convicted of your sins, if you are not miserable because of a lie you sold, if you are not bothered by not reading your Bible, you are not saved. But pastor, you're being me. No, that's the most loving thing I can tell you right now is that if you are not convicted of your sins, you are not saved. But here's the good news. Let's get it settled today. Oh, the worst thing that can happen is someone to cross their arms and say, listen here, I don't care what he says. I'm going to believe whatever I want. Man, don't risk eternity. Hey, if the pastor's pointing out and is, if the pastor has ever come to you at any time and said, sir, I don't think that you're saved. That should be a big warning that said there's something wrong. Maybe I should go make sure this is nailed down. That's the greatest thing that can happen today is for someone to get it settled. I can't tell you over the years how many people who thought they were saved all of their life 
who realized they were not. I had a song leader once. He was a song leader of that church for 13 years. We went through discipleship in the middle of discipleship. He said, I'm not saved. Can we get that settled? Absolutely. Got that settled. When he got saved, all of a sudden other people in the church who'd been members for a while said, you know what? I don't think I'm saved either. You know what? That was a healthy thing for the church. That wasn't a bad thing. We're getting things nailed down. We're trying to make sure this is not something you play with. The church that I was an assistant to the pastor to. We, um, <coughs> we had a young lady who said, I've been in church all of my life, you know, and I don't think I'm saved. Well, she got saved and all the no next thing you know, a deacon got saved. When the deacon got saved, a good number of the people of the church said, I've been a member of a church for a while. You know what? And I don't think I'm saved. And they all got it settled and the church was better off because of it. I'm not going to say this guy's name. He was a good preacher, a big church in Memphis, Tennessee. He big, famous writer. I have a lot of his books. But one time he said, you know what? I think about half of my church is not saved. They attend week after week after week. And I don't think they're saved. He said that with a broken heart. Now remember, it's God's job to save people. The only thing that we could do is spread the gospel message. And a message like this, the best thing I could do is try to shake you loose. If you're not saved, the most loving thing I could do right now is to convince you of that. So we can get that fixed. Get it nailed down. Don't play with this. Do you know that you know that you know from the Bible? Are you 100% sure that if something was to happen to you, that you are forgiven of your sins based off of what the Bible has to say? Not an experience that you had. I cannot tell you how many times someone will say, hey, I know I'm going to heaven. How do you know you're going to heaven? Because I had a dream one last night that there was a big white light and there was such a peace and I know I'm fine. No, what does the Bible have to say? What does the Bible have to say? Well, I know I went to a church and I spoke in tongues. What does that have to do with anything? What does the Bible have to say? Have you found out what the Bible has to say? And if you don't know what it has to say, it'd be my great privilege to take an open Bible and show you from God's word how you can know without a doubt. Why? Because this is important. Going back to the time frame of the wheat and the tares. When Jesus Christ comes back and those who of us who have accepted Christ, we're coming back with him. When he comes back, there's going to be a judgment upon those who are alive in the world at that time. And those who have accepted Christ as their savior, God's going to put on one side. And those who have not accepted Christ as their savior are going to be set on another the ones who are saved, they're going to enter the millennial kingdom in their physical bodies. Those who have not accepted Christ as their Savior, they're going to be judged right then and there, and they're going to be cast into hell. God knows who is His. My sheep hear my voice, and they hear me. Do you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven? Don't let someone lie to you. Don't let some radio preacher lie to you. Don't let some past experience lie to you. What does the Bible have to say? For those of you who um, are saved, then another application, be patient with your preacher. Why does he have to preach like this? Because I want to see people saved. It break my heart to have y'all people in here whom I love and someone not make it to heaven. Because you were deceived. My job is to do whatever it can to shake things loose that you know, that you know, that you know. And you can know. Not because I said so, but because the Bible says so. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time 
to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.